What do you think we ought to do? Praise the Lord. Amen. Praise the Lord and preach the word. I want to take some time and do that. But first, I want to highlight a few things over this past year. I'm, I'm grateful to the Lord for all that he has done. We've had some really high moments. We've had some down times as well. We've had some, some increase and we've had some decrease. And all of that, though, is part of the plan and purposes of God. How many of you know that nothing happens outside God's knowledge and His allowance? Anything that happens, whether it's good, whether it's bad, God either wills it or He allows it. And there's a whole lot of theology around that that we won't get into, but it's very important that we understand that concept. And so whatever has happened this past year in your life and in my life, God has been intricately involved in it. We, we're excited to, to see, you know, 23 people joined our church this past year. We had, amen. We had 14 people baptized, and we've got others lined up to be baptized because they've given their hearts to Jesus that we're going to be baptizing in the new year. We've, we had 121 visitors over the course of the 12 months. That's 10 per month. Now, that's not nearly the, the number I'd like to see, but yet we praise God for that because we praise God that God is involved in drawing people. God is involved in moving people. God is involved in realigning people. And, you know, as a young pastor, I would have been very discouraged by a lot of things that I've seen in my older years. How many of you can attest to that in your own life? When you were younger, things affected you a lot more dramatically and a lot more emotionally than as you get older and a little wiser and a little more understanding of how life works and how people work and how things happen. And as a pastor, you know, it would be very easy for me to be discouraged sometimes by what I see, what I hear, what I experience. But in the end, it's like, you know what? I just trust the Lord. I really have come to a place in my life where I'm very secure in the Lord. I'm not even secure in me. See, sometimes we think, well, you're very secure in yourself. Well, no, don't be secure in yourself because self can, can play tricks on you. It's about being secure in the Lord because when we're secure in the Lord, we know that that's stable ground because the Lord never changes. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Amen? Our emotions can change, our feelings can change, our perspectives can change. There are certain things about us that can change, but God never will. So my security is not in me. It's not in the things that I have. It's not in, in the circumstances and situations of life. My security is in the Lord. And therefore, my confidence remains in Him. And so we're grateful for all that God is doing, all that God will do, and all that God will continue to do as we move into a new year. We want to see more people join our church. We want to see more people baptized. We want these waters to be stirred consistently every month. We want to see more people discipled. We want to see more families restored, more homes brought back together because there's so many that are, tr that are in trouble right now not just in our church, but even in our community. And we have people come by all the time wanting help, wanting to be counseled, wanting a pastor. And uh, it, it's, it's amazing that when people get in trouble, they turn to the church. And they want to know how the Lord can help them. And so it's an opportunity for us to win them to Christ and share Christ with them. And so we want more of that to happen. We're so glad that we're located here where people can get to us. And, and sometimes they don't know what we are. You know, sometimes they think we're like Barnum and Bailey, you know, the big tent. But uh, once they get down here, they see the sign, they walk in, they ask the questions, and they realize, you know, who we are and what we are. But there are those who do know that we're church, and there are those who will come by and say, hey, I, we just need help. Can you help us? And we never turn anyone away. I'm surprised that I've heard people tell us they've gone to other churches and they couldn't help them. I'm really amazed by that because isn't that why we're here? We're here as a, as a landmark in the community. We're here as an embassy in the community. The Gate Church, you know, sometimes people want to do home church and all that kind of stuff, and I believe in life groups, but I believe in a, in a local church, a, a, a place 
that says, it's a, it's a landmark, it's a marker point that's put down in the soil of a community that says, this is the house of God. You can come here and get help for anything you need. That's why, that's why the, the local church is important. And, and, and this whole movement away from the local church, a movement away from having a, a landmark in a community, I think is not of the Lord because the Lord wanted us to be an embassy a landmark for people to come. Not a museum, not a memorial, but a place where people can really grow and get help that they need. I'm grateful for you, a giving people. Our giving increased this past year over the previous year. Now, many of you who have been here long, how many of you have been here more than 10 years? All right. How many of you have been here more than 15 years? All right. Awesome. And they're still sticking it out after all these years. How many of you have been here less than 10 years? Less than five years? Wow, that's a good number. Less than three years? Look at here. That's a good number as well. Less than two years? Good numbers? Yeah. You see, we're, gro- we're still growing. You say, well, there's a lot of people that aren't here that was here 10 years ago. I know. <laughs> but don't, don't pour cold water on me right now. I'm excited about who's here. I'm excited about you. Because God puts in your hand those whom he entrusts you with. And he's put us in each other's hands because he trusts us with each other. And what he wants is he wants our relationships and our love for each other to grow and become stronger and stronger and stronger. And, and we, we want to be positioned and we want to be placed where we can really respond to each other when there's a need. That's what community is all about. And that's what we want to see uh, in 2018 more so than ever before. But thank you for your giving heart. Thank you for, for how you have served uh, this body and how you have given into this body through your prayers. Even if you don't have money to give, it's not just about money. It's about giving anything and everything that we have to the cause of Christ. Amen? Time as well as treasure. Our, we took in 400, 500, well, depending on today, of course, we're around $540,000 in tithes. That's, that's not counting designated giving, which is another, you know, 75 to 100. I haven't really checked the figures, but I would say eighty to $100,000 in designated giving on top of that. Thank you for your faithfulness to give. That didn't quite meet our budget, but guess what? We didn't spend our budget. Matter of fact, we spent about $25,000 less than what we took in. And after the, the finances are done for today, we'll have uh, the exact figures. So I'm giving you a little bit of guesswork, but I'm really close. So I just want to say thank you for your faithfulness. And the Lord has been good to us. And he's enabled us, despite our size as a church, to accomplish a great deal. As a matter of fact, we've seen, as we've said, people saved and homes reached and people changed and, and all kinds of good things happen in marriages and so forth, and we want to see that increase in 2018. And so in 2018, we're going to be focused more on life group development. We're not going to have this big vision that's incapable of being accomplished, but we certainly want to see more life groups formed over the course of this next year. We have several new people in our church that have a heart for this ministry and have already, you know, spoken some great ideas and some good input into how we can develop and how we can grow in our life groups. We have some wonderful life. If you're a life group leader, would you stand up or a host home? I know Paul Tam uh, leads a group. I know the Jones lead a group over here in Apple Valley. I know Pastor Charlie leads a group. Miss Tammy leads. Yeah, you're a life group leader, right? A home group leader. Come on. Uh, and so we have several different. Uh, we have young adult groups. Uh, Zach's in the back. He's, he's not standing. He's sitting, but he's working. I don't know what he's doing, actually. But uh, he's doing something back there. So we have, we have groups that are specialized, and then we have general groups. But we want more groups. We want groups in Hesperia. How many of you live in Hesperia? 
All right, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. There's a home group right there. Now we just need someone to lead that home group, right? And then start growing uh, in our community or in the community of Hesperia. We have two or three groups in Apple Valley. We have a couple in Victorville. But we have a large area that we can reach more people. Amen? So we want in 2018 to be uh, more focused on our life group development. We have Wednesday night Bible studies. We are going through the Word of God on Wednesday nights. Um, we've, uh, Zach and Josh and different ones have been leading that, and I teach every now and then as well. It's a wonderful opportunity for you to learn the Word of God on Wednesday nights. It's a smaller, more intimate setting, although we'd like it to grow and be more. I think there's probably 30, 35 people uh, on a regular basis that attend on Wednesday nights, but we want to invite all of you, if you can, if you're not working or you're not tied up with other things, then please come out and be a part of Wednesday night Bible study. On Wednesday nights, we have things for our children. Our Awana program this year has been wonderful. It has been one of the best things that we've done in a long time. We have, I think, uh, well over 65 or 70 kids that are registered that are here on Wednesday nights. That's a lot of children. And, uh, and a lot of those children are from the community. People who aren't even part of our church are bringing their children because they found out there's an Awana program here. And so we're excited about ministering to our children. We have our youth groups that are meeting on Wednesday night. And uh, uh, Joseph and Jenny are, are, are youth leaders and youth pastors, and they're doing such a wonderful job. And it's growing, and uh, new kids are coming, and kids are starting to connect, and we want to see that even increase more and more and more as the activities and the events increase on Wednesday nights. We have specialized Bible studies here at the gate. We have women's Bible studies uh, from time to time throughout the year. We'll have men's Bible studies. We have BSF for both men and women here, and the Floreses are very involved in leading that, and we're so grateful for their influence and the fact that we can host it here at the gate is uh, because BSF is a, is a regional, national ministry, but it has regions, and we've just been privileged to be able to host BSF here, so please take advantage of that. We have spiritual retreats that we're um, planning this year. We have a men's retreat in September. We have a women's retreat in October. Uh, Miss uh, Christy Duncan, who is uh, Jade Duncan, you remember Jade who came and preached here, his wife, Christy, is going to come and be our featured speaker. We're still working on a speaker for our men's event. But those are going to be exciting in the fall. And prior to that in the summer, the youth are going to be doing some things. The children are going to be doing some things. We have seasonal ministry opportunities. Easter is our next big thing. Uh, we always love Easter time. We have Memorial Day picnic. we got Mother's Day events, Father's Day events, Thanksgiving and Christmas next year. We have a worship concert that we're going to be hosting here at the gate. It is going to be Ethan Butler on April the 29th. Now, how many of you know who Ethan Butler is? All right, about three or four or five of you. Ethan Butler was on, was it American Idol or The Voice? He was on The Voice, and he made it pretty far. He didn't win it, but he made it pretty far. But he's a born-again Christian. His father's a pastor at Moody Church in Chicago, and uh, he does worship uh, events, and he's going to come on that fifth Sunday night in April, and he's going to uh, be here to lead us in worship, and we're just going to we're gonna promote it in the community as an outreach, and we want to get you know, six, seven, eight hundred people in this building if we can. We might have to move some chairs, and it might be standing room only. We'll create a mosh pit if we have to. But it's going to be a great event with Ethan Butler. You can look him up online. He's a very gifted young man. We spent time with him, communicating with him. So that's going to be a big event as an outreach. And then, of course, the fifth Sunday nights are going to be our Ecclesia nights. Other than the April 29th one's the only one that's going to be different. And then uh, Benjamin Sundays. We've got mission trips this year that you can take advantage of. We're going to India. We're going to Nicaragua. So if you're interested in that, please see Pastor Charlie. And then there are other ministries that meet, meet the needs of our community. We have our food and our clothing ministry with Miss Mary Lee, who leads that, and her team, who do just a wonderful job of feeding hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of families in the community. The, the statistics are 
incredible in terms of how many people we're able to reach, and they're getting a gospel presentation each time they're receiving food. And that's a wonderful ministry here at the gate. We're starting Celebrate Recovery in February. Celebrate Recovery is a national ministry that we're going to be sponsoring here as well with our people who are being trained. We're going to be working with people who are, uh, have addictions of any sort, uh, whether it's alcohol, drugs, eating, any kind of disorder. We're going to be working and helping people find Christ and find healing in Christ through Celebrate Recovery. Our Gateway Health and Healing Center and Wellness Center is, is underway, and that's another opportunity to help people with different needs, spiritual and otherwise emotional needs. We're going to be doing life skills and job skills training for people coming out of the prison system. And uh, we're going to be trying to help get them acclimated back into society. And then one of the things that's on my heart is I want to be involved in the foster care system. I believe that there's no greater way to reach children and to bring Christ into someone's heart than to be a foster care parent. And uh, one of the things that the county and uh, other organizations, some Christian-based organizations have done is they've, they've offered to help us to be able to at least make people aware of the opportunity and the needs. And so this is just another way to outreach into our community. These are just a handful of things that we have a heart and a vision for. Now, that's, there's a lot more, but that's eating into my sermon time, so I'm going to stop there. But I, I just felt like it's important for you to be aware of what God has done throughout this past year and what we believe that He's going to do through us in this upcoming year. It's about casting vision. Where there is no vision, people perish. Where there is no vision, people cast off restraint, which means there's no discipline, there's no, no structure, there's no direction. And one of the things that we want to always do is provide direction for you. And in my message here in just a moment, we'll talk a little bit about that. So are you excited about what God is doing? Amen. Through our international outreach, we have seen over the last 20 years, we've seen over 250,000 people uh, become Christians over the last 20 years. We've, we've trained over 30,000 leaders. We've worked in, and revitalized over 1,500 churches. Uh, we've had medical teams that have gone and met the needs of so many in different villages and communities in Africa, Central America, India, and other places. We've had evangelism teams go forth and do a variety of things. There's so much that this little church in the Victor Valley High Desert region has been able to do. And I want to say thank you from the bottom of our heart. We're very, very grateful. Let's pray. Father, we love you and we thank you and we praise you for all that you are doing. Because really it's about what you're doing. And we're just grateful that you've included us in your effort. Help us to do more, Lord. Help us to bring greater honor and glory to your name. Father, help us to be obedient. Lord, help us to be faithful. Lord, let us realize that the giving that you enable us to, to give is seed planted in the soil of the kingdom, and it grows a harvest, and we thank you for that. Be with us now over the next few moments as we bring your word. May we be challenged and encouraged in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I hope you've gotten uh, the feel from me that I'm a grateful man. I'm a very grateful man. I stand here grateful. I'm grateful for a wonderful family, uh, four children who love the Lord, who are serving the Lord, who married fairly good. Be nice, okay. No, they, they very, married very good. Uh, people who love the Lord as well. They've given us... I. God only knows how many grandchildren, 15 grandchildren who are all being raised in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. I'm a grateful man. I'm a grateful father. I'm a grateful grandfather. I'm thankful for a wife who is the most loving and godly person I know. I'm grateful for a church full of incredible people who love us despite us, or in spite of us, <laughs> um, a people who love others, 
who give graciously, as we've already talked about, out of the abundance of your own hearts, a church that has given us joy in serving you. And uh, we can think of nothing else we'd rather do in life than to be here with you, living life together and serving you uh, and God's purposes. I'm most of all grateful for Jesus, who has given me abundant life, given me this opportunity to just serve Him in the ways that we do. And more than that, He's given us life eternal. You know, whether you want me to or not, I'll never die. I'm going to live forever. Come on. You too, if you know Jesus. And we're stuck with each other for eternity. You might get tired of me here and kind of go a different way for a while, but you can't get away from me. I've told people who once were here or not here anymore, you can't get away from me. You're stuck with me. So there's so much to be thankful for as we close out another year. 2017 has been great though not without its challenges. We began with a theme, Year of Reformation, which that will be coming down this week uh, because this year is over. Our focus has been threefold. Our focus has been on a healthy fellowship, a growing community, and a fruitful ministry. That's been our threefold focus throughout the year. And we covered quite a bit since January, if you remember. I hope you remember. I hope you don't forget the things that we teach. But we covered quite a bit dealing with things such as how to have a heart after God's own heart. That's what we did in January. Remember the David Chronicles? A man after God's own heart. And we started there. And then we moved from there to the power of marriage and the power of family. And then we began to talk about the theology of the temple. Remember, I went all the way to the garden, talked about how the garden was God's abiding place and how that we are each temples of the Lord. We're temples of the Holy Spirit, and God lives inside those of you who know Him. And so we are the temple of God, and we talked about the theology of the temple. We talked about the health and the wellness of the local church and its role as the ecclesia, the government of heaven on earth. We talked about cultural and social transformation. We talked about the invisible realm and the reality of the kingdom of God. We talked about in this last series the pneuma, the breath of God, and the empowered life that can only be lived under the unction of the Holy Spirit. These are all some of the topics that we covered this past year, and these topics were all intentional, and they have continuity as they teach us the purpose and plans of God for each of our lives as well as our families' lives. I hope you've seen the continuity from heart to family to church to society to the power of the Holy Spirit to the bigness of the invisible realm and the, and the physical realm and how they interact together. All of this has continuity, teaching us a firm foundation on how to live life the most effective and fruitful way as possible, hoping to bring us to these three things, a healthy fellowship, a growing community, and a fruitful ministry. See, I'm not one of those guys who does things randomly. I don't just think about, okay, what am I going to do this Sunday? You know, let me just think of a good idea. Or let me just think of a, something that can kind of help them for the next, you know, six weeks. No, God, I pray into and I think through and I, I, I prepare in my heart with the Holy Spirit to bring something that's going to create continuity in our lives and build precept upon precept, block upon block, so the house of God can actually be built in you, the temple of God. And so there's purpose in everything that we do. These topics were intended to strengthen you in your faith and give you an understanding of your unique destiny in God. That's my primary purpose in life. My primary purpose in life is to glorify God by making Him known through teaching His Holy Word. And I love the Bible. I love the Holy Word of God because it communicates to us the living Word of God. And the more we know this, the more we'll know Him. But this doesn't contain everything about Him. There's much more to Him than even what's contained in these pages. And so we must realize that But we must dive into this as deeply as we possibly can. And I pray that you've experienced spiritual growth in your life over this past year and and that you're engaging your purpose in God. 
I pray that you are in love with Jesus far more than you were January 2017. As you move into January 2018, I hope you're more excited and more passionate to be uh, with Him and to serve Him than you were last year. You see, our vision here has not changed. Our, our vision remains the same. It's always been the same. It's never changed. We might tweak a word here or there in order to bring it more into where we are in time and history, but our vision has never changed since the first day I walked into this place, August 27th, 2001. The church exists, the gate church exists to do two things. Redeem people. Say, redeem people. And secondly, to renew creation. That's our vision, is to redeem people and to renew creation. And we do that in three ways. Are you ready? By making disciples, creating community, and revealing the kingdom of God. Come on, somebody ought to shout. And all of that is done in four ways. So I call it the two, three, four plan, right? Kind of like Weight Watchers has their thing, you know. We, we got our thing. It is done through compassionate evangelism, corporate edification, Christian education, and cultural engagement. I try to make it easy for you by alliterating things. CEs. There you go. A bunch of CEs. So it, it's... It's compassionate evangelism. What does that mean? It's what we do through the food and clothing. It's what we're going to be doing and have done through the Gate and Healing Wellness Center. It's what we're going to be doing through Celebrate Recovery. It's compassionate evangelism. It's not just pounding people over the head with a Bible and saying, you got to get saved, you got to repent, or you're going to hell. But rather, it is giving them the gospel, but also showing them the gospel. Amen. Compassionate evangelist, caring for people, more than just getting them signed up, you know, saying a prayer. It's about getting them enlisted in following Jesus Christ. And so the way we do that is by being compassionate in the way in which we evangelize. It's about corporate edification. So once we get people saved, we want to bring them into the family of God so that they can then be part of the corporate family and be edified, built up in God, corporate edification. I hope that's what you're uh, experiencing here today is that you're being corporately edified, built up in God by being encouraged and enlightened and excited for the things of God. And then there's Christian education. There's a variety of ways in which we do that through our Bible studies and through our discipleship programs and through Sunday mornings. And then there's cultural engagement. It's not about us just living in the four walls of the church, but rather getting outside the church, taking what we're learning in the church, in the body, in the corporate fellowship, and then living it out here in the world, engaging the culture. When the culture says one thing, we go to the Word of God and see what God says. And we don't just buy into what the world says, we, we believe what God says. And if what God says is contradictory to the world, then we go with God over the world. And we speak God's Word into the culture around us. This is what it means to culturally engage. It's, it's about doing it individually, as families, but also as a church, as a community of believers. And so in this, our ultimate goal is to make disciples, create community, reveal the kingdom, and renew people, renew creation and redeem people. That's our vision here at the gate. Amen? Now, I know that's a mouthful. But when we break it down, it's really not that complicated. It's the simple gospel. It's the great commission and the means through which they are achieved. And to embrace this vision, we must totally surrender to change. Say change. Now, change is a complicated thing. The gospel is a simple thing, but change is complicated. And in change, we must be willing to have our hearts and our minds transformed. We rarely volunteer for change, but change is simple and, in, and, and it's an inevitable element in our journey on this road in life. We can embrace it, we can endure it, or, or we can erase it in our lives, but we must all deal with change. Change is happening all around us, and it's always going to be happening. 
Change requires some things. It requires three things that I want to focus on this morning, so I want you to write these down. They're in your notes, but make some additional notes if the Lord speaks to you. First, change requires an awareness of the need to change. Come on. Change requires an awareness that we need to change. It also requires a determination to pursue change. And then thirdly, it requires a commitment to remain changed. Now, these might be three things you've not quite heard put that way before. Because when God gave these to me, I thought, wow, that's an interesting take on change. But I think they're very relevant for us today. So let's talk first about the awareness of the need to change. Because as we go into a new year, this is the time when everyone's making resolutions. I'm going to be different this year than I was last year. And by the time Tuesday gets here, it's all done. So we need to know what areas do we really do need changed and how do we pursue that change and how do we commit to remaining in that change. Well, the first thing is an awareness of the need to change. Here's... An example from Scripture. In Luke chapter 15, we see the story of the prodigal son. And there's a lot of principles we can gain from his life. And we're going to talk about a few out of this topic, awareness of the need to change. Because you see, the first thing that I realize is that there's an awareness. I need to be aware of my condition and my circumstances. You know, how many of you remember uh, Kenny Rogers in the first edition? Was it first edition or new edition? I think it was first edition. I, I don't hear a lot of noise, so a lot of you don't remember who that is. He used to sing a song. You remember the old song? What condition is my condition in? Well, that's kind of where we're at today. We need to determine what condition is my condition in. What condition is my life in? What condition is there, and to be aware of my condition, to be aware of my circumstances and my situations in life. The prodigal son is a good illustration. We won't read the Scripture because I think you know the story well enough, but it is found in Luke 15, 11 through 32. The prodigal son took all that he had received from his father, his inheritance, and he spent his inheritance on the wrong things. He wasted his blessing. His life declined into the slums of the world. And finally, the Bible tells us in that story that he came to himself. Say, came to himself. Many of us need to come to ourselves and say, Self, (laughs) your condition is poor. Your condition has declined. Your condition and your circumstances are not what they ought to be. And that's where the prodigal son came to. He came to himself because he looked around and he saw the condition that he was in. He saw the circumstances of his life. Now, what was his condition? If you don't know the story that well, he had spent all of his money to the point now that he had no more money. Therefore, he couldn't afford to live in a proper way. So he ended up in the pig pen of life. Man, what a condition that was. What a circumstance he found himself in, all because he had wasted the blessing of his father. But there was a time that he was just going through the motions. There was a time when he was just accepting what was in front of him. No more money, no more good place to live, no more friends, because we know when all the money's gone, all your friends are gone. And and so... He, he had to barter a little bit and figure out, well, I, you know, the only place I can live is there, so i got to go there, and so he went there. So he must have been there at, at least for some time before he came to himself. He was living in a bad condition, in a bad circumstance, before he realized his circumstances and situation was severe. And so the Bible says he came to himself. He was like, what am I doing? Look around. My best friend is a hog. My best plate of food is corn on the cob. Slop. What a condition he was in. Think about what happened. Now, now, now let's, let's think about this in a larger way. The father gave to his son, and this represents the blessings that God has given to each of us. I mean, we're so blessed. 
If you don't believe you're blessed, you need to go to Nicaragua with us. If you don't think you're blessed, you need to go to India with us and just spend, you know, about 30 minutes in India and you'll come back rejoicing. No matter what your condition, your condition is in. You see, we have all been blessed. We've been blessed. We've, we have health. We have strength. We have resources. We have jobs. We have family. We have people who love us. And even if one of those things is weaker than the other, you at least have the other. Your, your health might be poor, but you got people who love you. We all have blessings of different sorts and different kinds and different strengths. We all have blessings, and they're all blessings come from God. Amen? Every good gift comes from above, the Bible says. But the prodigal son went out and he wasted his blessing. How often do we do the same thing? We've been blessed, 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 but we use the blessings for ourselves. We use the blessings in order to try to to maneuver or manipulate life the way we want life to be for ourselves, which is exactly what the prodigal son did. We're blessed of God, and yet we use all those blessings more often than not in unholy or at least in selfish ways. Eventually, we find ourselves in rough conditions. We find ourselves in circumstances that are, that are really not comfortable. But we don't realize that these consequences are not God's doing because He blessed us. And whatever He blesses you with, He has an assignment for that blessing. Come on. If you have good health, then God has put an assignment on your good health. Guess what? If you have poor health, He's put an assignment on your poor health. You say, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Poor health has an assignment. Of course, God can use your poor health to bring him honor and glory based upon how you treat the poor health that you have and how you remain faithful in the midst of your poor health. You see, everything that we have is a blessing of God, and every blessing comes with an assignment associated with it. The question is, do we know what that assignment is? Most of the time, we don't give any thought to that. We just take it for granted, and we use it however we want. Therefore, we waste it because it's wasted. Listen, what is waste? Waste is anything you use apart from the purpose for which it was designed. So if your health, if your resources, if your job, if your activity, if your talent, if your ability is a blessing from God and it has an assignment on it, but you don't use it for that assignment, it's wasted. Even if you think that it's brought you some measure of gain because you've used it the way you want to use it, it's not prosperous for you if it ultimately doesn't honor and glorify God. Because isn't everything designed to bring glory to God? Absolutely. So we best know what the assignment for the blessing that we have is in our lives. For some people, reaching this place is too late. They, they may realize their condition, they may realize their circumstances, but they're unwilling to change because their heart has hardened. I don't know if you've ever met someone whose heart has hardened, but it's a sad situation. A person who once was in love with God, a person who was once enjoying the blessings of the Lord, had the joy of the Lord, had the peace of God, and they were serving Him, serving Him, serving Him. But then uh, something began to happen where they began to use the blessings of God for their own benefit. And after time went on, then it became something self-serving. And now God was no longer soft in, in terms of their affection for Him. They, they grew hard towards God. And now they become a totally different person, a totally different person, someone who thinks differently, who feels differently, who acts differently, who behaves differently, all because their heart has grown hardened. And they may look around, and I've heard people say, yeah, I know I'm in a bad place, but, you know, that's the place that I'm in. That's what a hardened heart says. A hardened heart says, I know I'm not living for the Lord right now, but you know what? This is the best it gets for me at the moment. That's a hardened heart. They may recognize their condition. They may recognize their circumstances. If the prodigal son had looked around and said, man, this is a bad way. This is a bad condition I'm in. This is a bad circumstance. But you know what? I'm not going to do anything. I'm just going to try to work my way through it. That's a hardened heart because now he's got so much pride. He doesn't want to repent. He doesn't want to come clean. He doesn't want to return where the blessings once flowed from. You see, many people are living in that place. 
where they see their condition and their circumstances, but their heart's grown so hardened they may realize it but are unwilling to change because of the hardness of heart. Oh, what a sad place. Don't ever get there, my friend. Come on, look at someone and say, don't ever go there. So the first step is an awareness of our condition and our circumstances. The second thing is an awareness of our foolishness and our failures. More than being aware of condition and circumstances, there's a need for this. The prodigal son realized that the reason his condition and circumstances were dire was because he had been foolish and he had failed in his purpose for existing. You see, that's what I mean by understanding the assignment that is on the blessings that you have received. The prodigal son failed to realize that what his father gave to him was to be used for the purposes of God, not for the purposes of the prodigal. And once he forgot about that, he began to move away. But now he realizes, it's foolish for me to stay here. It's foolish for me to be here. I have failed in recognizing what all those blessings were for. You see, repentance is not being aware of our situation, but doing something about our situation. I've often said, and I'll say it again, repentance is not turning away from something. We think that if I just stop drinking, that's repentance. Or if I stop drugging, that's repentance. Or if I stop, you know, having adulterous affairs, that's repentance. No. What repentance is, is yes, stopping all those things, but turning unto the opposite spirit of those things. So now, instead of drinking, I replace drinking with something else. I'm drinking deeply now of the presence of God. Instead of drugging, I'm no longer drugging, but now I'm getting high on Jesus, which means I need to be where Jesus' people are. I need to be in the house of God. I need to be in the Word of God. I need to be in prayer. I need to be in the presence of God, right? Because you can't get high on Jesus unless you're in the right place to get high. Please don't edit this live stream and cut out the first and this last part. See, the reality is, is whatever we stop doing that's wrong, we turn to doing that which is right. That's repentance. And that's what the prodigal son needed to understand. My circumstances, my condition, I need to get away from, but I need to go somewhere where I will never return back to the same condition and circumstance again. Because if I do that, then I I continue in my failure. I continue in my foolishness. I need to do something about it. The third thing about being aware is this. He became aware of his self-righteousness and his self-reliance. And friend, this is so important to us. We need to recognize how many times we're self-righteous. And we're we're more self-righteous than we realize. And, and, And sometimes we are and we don't even realize it. See, the prodigal came to himself... He saw his condition and his circumstance. He acknowledged his foolishness and his failure, but, he, but also his self-righteousness and his self-reliance. Self-righteousness is this. Self-righteousness is a condition whereby we are convinced that whatever we do is the right thing simply because we decided it. I'm going to say it again because some of you are processing that. Self-righteousness is a condition whereby we are convinced that whatever we do, whatever we decide, or whatever we think is the right thing simply because we decided that that was the right thing. That's self-righteousness. You see, you are not the standard by which righteousness is determined. I am not the standard by which righteousness is determined, but we are not Righteousness, self-righteousness leads us to self-reliance. Now, here's what we recognize contextually in the story of the prodigal. The prodigal felt he deserved to receive what he got from the father. He went and asked for it, and he wouldn't have asked if he didn't think he deserved it. How many times do we ask God to bless us because we think we deserve it? See, you don't deserve a blessing. Come on, I don't deserve a blessing. None of us deserve blessings. That's why we need the grace of God. It's the grace of God. Grace of God is that He empowers us to do what we cannot do in our natural ability. And mercy and grace work together, which then 
qualifies us not based on our ability or not based on our deserving it, but rather based on the goodness of God. Because He's good, He blesses you. Not because you're good or because you deserve it, but sometimes we think we deserve it. And that's self-righteous. And what self-righteousness will do will lead you to self-reliance, which is exactly what happened to the prodigal son. Because he felt he deserved the blessings from his father, now he's going to take those, and rather than use them for the purposes of God, he began to use them for himself because he felt that he could rely on himself to make the wise decision with regard to his resources. Many people get in trouble. They get into conditions and circumstances because they don't have the wisdom to properly use the blessings that God gives them. And sometimes people wonder why they're not more blessed. I'll tell you why we're not more blessed, because we're not trusted to be able to handle the blessings that God gives us because we've proven in the past we haven't been able to handle the blessings of God. Are you hearing me? Now, this is not a negative sermon. This is an encouraging sermon. Because as we go into the new year, what we need to realize is that God will bless and wants to bless, but He wants us to be responsible with the blessings that He gives. Amen? But in order for that to happen, we got to change or ever be changing. You see, we must acknowledge our foolishness and our failures. We must acknowledge our condition and our circumstances. We must also acknowledge our self-righteousness and our self-reliance. It's amazing to see this pattern work in the lives of people over the 30 years that I've been pastoring. I've seen this situation so many times when somebody walks away from the Lord. Many of those same people who walk away from the Lord will actually try and justify their behavior by using religious talk as if God was okay with their actions of walking away. I mean, I've literally had people tell me, well, God's okay with this. Well, how, how is God okay with you being unfaithful? How is God okay with you being prideful? How is God okay with you being sinful and foolish? And yet we try to twist the Word of God. We try to twist spirituality to make it seem like, well, because I, I know what God wants for me. Oh, it's an individual thing, right? The Bible is, 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 really doesn't mean what it says, and it doesn't say what it means. It says what it means. See, we have to be aware of our need to change. And the first step is that we need to change, right? But then there must be a second thing, a determination to pursue change. Say that with me. Determination to pursue change. See, our goal for 2018 should be to make some determinations that will take us into our destiny. Let, let me talk about destiny for a second. Every one of you has a, a destiny, individually, as a family, and we have a destiny as a church. Now, I'm convinced that no church will fulfill its destiny until the majority of the people in that church are convinced of their individual family destiny, and therefore the bulk of destiny is determined by the individual makeup. Does that make sense? It's like, it's like blending two colors. You have to have the majority of one color before it starts looking more like that color than the other color. And so the blending of destinies is important. So when churches don't reach their destiny, it's because the bulk of the church on an individual or family basis hasn't embraced their own destiny. So our goal, my goal as a pastor, is to get every one of you in the, moving in the same direction so that the majority of us know what we've been called to. That's why we talked about gifts, and that's why we t we're going to be doing some gift assessments, and we're going to be helping individuals know who they are and what their destiny and what they're calling in, because destiny is where we need to be headed, right? So what determinations do we need to make? Here's the first one, and I'm going to move quick through this point to get to my last point. We need to make a determination to avoid the defilement of the heart. You need to, stay, you need to say this. Don't make a New Year's resolution, but make a declaration in God. So there's a big difference in making a, a, a fleshly resolution and making a, a spiritual declaration in God. Because in God, you want to declare what God has de already declared about you. 
And so what God has said in his word is, do not defile yourself with the king's meat. Do not defile yourself with worldly ways. The story that we go to in this is Daniel. Daniel was a young man that made a determination. Taken captive into slavery, along with a lot of other young people, the king said, now I want all of you to eat the menu that we put in front of you. That menu was dedicated to God's. And it was also not a healthy menu for a Jew. And so there were two reasons why Daniel rejected the meal. The first one was because it was dedicated to God. The second was because it was not a meal that God would, would have been pleased with for their dietary standards. And so Daniel decided, he made a decision, he made a determination. He said, I will not defile myself with the king's meat. Now, there are many things in this world that are dedicated to false gods or, or, or demonic powers. And the world is full of this. Amen? And yet, there are many things that we participate in that are dedicated to those evil forces. The worldliness, the philosophies of the world. And God says in His Word, do not defile yourself. Do not defile your heart. Do not defile your mind. Do not defile your body with the things that will destroy you and lead you astray and away from glorifying God. If our chief aim in life is to glorify God, you cannot defile yourself and glorify God at the same time. It's an impossibility. And so we need to make some determinations in God, make some declarations in God. I will not put myself in a position, put myself in a place in 2018 where the enemy is going to have his way with my heart. But rather, I will not defile myself. I will stand strong in my faith. I will stand strong in, my, in the Word. I will stand strong in prayer. I will stand strong in worship. And I will guard myself from the things that would destroy me. Make a determination. Make a determination like Daniel did. We must be like Daniel in these days when there's so much darkness around, vying for our affections. We must avoid the defilement of our heart. In other words, guard your heart. Say guard. King Solomon said it best. He said in Proverbs 4.23, above all else, guard your heart for it is the wellspring of life. Above all else. In other words, not just when it's convenient. Not just once in a while. Not just consider possibly doing this thing. No, he said above all else. In other words, above all other things in life, guard your heart. That's priority. That's primary. Now, there's reasons why. Are you ready? You need to know this. Because your heart is extremely valuable. We don't guard worthless things, do we? We take our garbage to the street every Wednesday night. It's picked up on Thursday morning in our neighborhood. It sits on the sidewalk all night completely unguarded. I don't even put my watchdog out there. Why? Because it's worthless. Not so with your heart. Your heart is the essence of who you are. It is your authentic self, the core of your very being. It is where all your dreams and all your desires and your passions live, in your heart. It is, it is that part of you that connects with God and connects with other people. And just like your physical body, if your heart, your spiritual heart dies, you end up being the walking dead, like a zombie. And that's why Solomon says, above all else, above all else, guard your heart. That should be your chief responsibility in 2018. Guard your heart. Why? Because for some of you men, the, the computer is going to be an issue. For some of you men, another woman is going to be an issue. For some of you men, walking away from your family and responsibilities is going to be an issue. For some of you women, I would say the exact same thing. Because we live in a day now where it's not just men issues, it is women issues as well. Every one of us is going to be confronted with some dark force in 2018 that's going to attempt to rob you from God and rob God of His glory. 
and you are the glory of God. And if he can snatch you away, he will do everything in his power to do so. That is why we must make a determination right now to say, I will not defile my heart. I will guard my heart. I will be around people who love me enough to tell me like it is, who won't just out of convenience or comfort's sake forsake telling you what is right and wrong, but tell you who you are and whose you are because you are the glory of God. Guard your heart. Make that determination because your heart is valuable. Amen. Secondly, because your heart is the source of everything you do. King Solomon goes on to say, after he says, above all else, guard your heart, he says, for it is the wellspring of life. In other words, it is the source of everything else in your life, your heart. Is the source of everything else in your life. Your heart overflows into thoughts, into words, and into actions and behavior. In Georgia, where we used to live, we have thousands of natural springs where water flows to the surface of the earth from deep under the ground. It accumulates in pools or it runs into creeks and streams. I'm sure it is here in the mountains of California as well. And if you plug up the spring, you stop the flow of water, right? If you poison the water, the flow becomes toxic. In either situation, you threaten the life that is downstream. Everything depends on the condition of the spring. Likewise, if your heart is unhealthy or unholy, it has an impact on everything else in your life. Your heart does. You do. It threatens your family, your friends, your ministry, your career, your children, and indeed your legacy and your future if you don't guard your heart knowing that it's the wellspring of life. It is therefore the imperative that you take this responsibility seriously. Can I get a witness? Number three, guard your heart because your heart is under constant attack. When Solomon says this, he implies that you are living in a combat zone, one in which there are casualties, and many are oblivious to the reality of this war. We have an enemy. We have an enemy, and that enemy, as I've said already, has been on our destruction. He not only opposes God, but he opposes everything that is aligned in him, including us. And Satan uses all kinds of weapons to attack our heart. For me, and I'll just be transparent with you this morning, it is the last day of the year, and everything this year is gone, right? So now we're going into a new year. So I'm repenting right now in front of you. For me, these attacks that I'm talking about often come in the form of some circumstance or situation or, or, or episode that leads to disappointment or discouragement or even disillusionment. And those three things, when combined, discouragement, disappointment, and disillusionment, when they're combined, they can actually lead you to a give-up mentality. How many of you ever felt like giving up before? Come on, join me. I'm, I'm confessing here. I'm, I'm, I'm putting myself out there. Join me, please, will you? And, and when that happens, there are, there are thoughts that cross my mind and heart. It's not worth it. You know, you've given so much and you've helped and did this and did that, and then it becomes a pity party. Woe is me. Oh, somebody pat me on the back. But, but there's this temptation to just, you know what? Fine. I'll just go do something. I'll go sell cars. We'll starve, but I'll try. You know, I'll go chop wood. I'll do something. You know, I'll help the you know the LaBeoufs. You know, <laughs> you know, but but then it's like the prodigal son. Come to yourself. Whose are you? Not who are you. Whose are you? You see. Guard your heart. Because you're going to be under attack. The enemy's going to come, try to discourage you, disillusion you, make you think that everybody's against you, nobody appreciates you. I mean, that's, the, that's, the, that, that's one of the most subtle but yet most powerful attacks of all. It's just to make you feel like nobody cares. You know, that's probably a more powerful weapon that the enemy has than, than adultery or, or, or drugs or alcohol. And those are powerful, and those are, those are more obvious, and it's very plain to see that from everybody. But those hidden things in the heart that affect us are the things that I think can be far more dangerous because it becomes a slow-spreading poison 
in your life. And it creates an attitude. It creates a mindset. It creates uh, such a disillusionment where you see things totally not as they really are. Are you hearing me? Guard your heart. Say, guard your heart. We must learn to do this with all diligence. So there's a determination to aggressively devote ourselves to holiness in our personal life, in our family life, in our church life, in our community life. And then my last point, and I'm going to do my best here to get this across. We must have a commitment to remain changed. When change happens, sometimes what happens, it only lasts temporarily. But there must be a commitment to living in the change. You know, I like the word transformation so much better than change, but change is more common to us in terms of our vocabulary. So that's why I chose to teach on this as opposed to the, you know, the spiritual word and the word we all like. It's kind of the catch word nowadays, transformation. Transformation is a, is a process. Trans means movement, transportation. Trans, you know, is a, is a movement towards something, towards formation, transformation. Change is the same thing, but I tend to think of change as mostly temporal, whereas transformation is permanent. Once we're transformed, like a butterfly that once was a caterpillar cannot go back and be a caterpillar anymore. He's been transformed, metamorphosized, if you will. But there are other ways in which we can process this and say, but change, you know, if you, if you change, you can change back. If you change forward, you can change backwards. But that's why it's important for us to realize, wait a minute, I don't want that. I don't want to go back. I don't want to be b- back in the same condition where I was found or the circumstances that I was in because I, I've made a commitment to, to pursue change. And now once I'm changed, once things have, have shifted in my life, I want to stay in this new place permanently. Amen? Now, we're always going to be changing. So the question is, I always want to be changing forward, never changing backwards. Right? So if I'm, if I'm here and I change and now I'm here, I ne- that, that to me no longer exists. That, that old way of living, that old pattern of life is no longer in existence. So I don't want to even be, I don't even want it to be possible for me to go back to here anymore but I will still be changing. So now I'm not changing backwards. I'm changing forward. I'm changing into something that I've never experienced before, but yet is not something that is contrary to God's design for me. Because just because I've never experienced it before doesn't mean it's not reality in God's world. I want to be changing forward. Amen? You got that? So how do I Remain changed or remain changing forward is really a more accurate way of saying it. Well, it starts with a new thought life being developed. Come on. A new thought life being developed. See, if, if, if I think I've changed, and maybe I have changed, but my thought life hasn't completely converted to a new way of, of behaving, then it's possible that old thoughts can come back, which drives me back. But if I have a new way of thinking, and the old way of thinking no longer exists in me, then the only thing I can do is think forward. Because the new takes me forward. The old always keeps me back. Jonathan Edwards put it this way. He said, The ideas and images in men's minds are the invisible powers that constantly govern them. That's so true. Thus, it's critical for each of us to bring our thought life into submission to Jesus Christ by learning to think biblically about every aspect of life. One of the most helpful things I've learned about the Christian life is that all sin begins in our thoughts, which the Bible calls the heart. Jesus said in Mark 7, 20 through 23, that which proceeds out of the man, that is what defiles the man. 
For from within, out of the heart of men, proceed the evil thoughts, fornications, thefts, murders, adulteries, deeds of coveting and wickedness, as well as deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, and foolishness. All these evil things proceed from within and defile the man. You see, no one commits the outward sins without first having committed them in his mind. If we want to grow in godliness, we must win the battle over the sin of the thought life at the thought level. A Christian thought life is also an integral part to a life of joy as found in Philippians chapter 4 as well as a life of peace also in Philippians chapter 4. In every situation, if you want joy and peace, it's about how you think. It's about your perspective. And since our thoughts form the basis for our behavior, a godly thought life is essential for obedience. So that's the first thing. We need a new way of thinking. Secondly, we need new behavioral patterns established as a result of the new way of thinking. Because when you start thinking differently, you'll start behaving differently. A good story, and I'm just alluding to it because of time, is Genesis 32 and the story of Jacob. You remember Jacob? Jacob is a good example. Jacob ran away from home after buying his brother Esau's inheritance and stealing the blessing that rightfully belonged to Esau as the firstborn son. He then worked, think about this, he worked 14 years for his uncle Laban to get two wives. Well, he needs a new way of thinking for sure. And one of the wives he didn't really want. Now, Jacob has come to a place in his life where he wants to go home. But to get home, he would have to cross over the brook called Jabbok. The problem is, his brother Esau, whom he stole the birthright from, is on the other side of the brook with 400 men and a promise to kill Jacob. But Jacob is kind of between a rock and a hard place, if you will. So he sends his wives and his maids and his sons. He sends them all across the river, and he stays on the other side. And he's, of course, always the schemer, right? Because that's what Jacob's known for, a trickster, a manipulator. He's always, again, self-righteous and self-reliant, always trying to do things on his own, recognizing his condition and his circumstances, his foolishness and his failure, but never really changing, always using his manipulative ways to get things done. And so once again, he tries it. He sends messengers with gifts to Esau to pave the way home. But the messengers return to Jacob, And the news is not good. Esau is on to Jacob. He knows his conniving ways. And he's got those 400 men all ready to seize Jacob when Jacob comes his way. Jacob cannot buy his way out of this situation this time. He's stuck. In front of him is Esau, behind him is his past, the lies, the deceptions, the stolen blessing, the home he left behind. He's now keenly aware of his condition and circumstances, but will he pursue real change? That's the question. It's nighttime, and Jacob is alone on the banks of the Jabbok, and all night long, Jacob wrestles with a man there. Now, the question is, who was that man? Was it God? Was it Esau? Was it Jacob's uncle Laban? Was it Isaac, his father? Was Jacob wrestling with himself? Was he wrestling with his past, his future, his identity, his faith? Perhaps the best and maybe the only answer to these questions is yes, yes, that's who it was. Regardless, we know this, it was a face-to-face meeting with God. It was a come-to-Jesus moment for Jacob. And in this nighttime wrestling, Jacob is both wounded and blessed. The two always seem to go together, wounding and blessing. His old life and identity is Jacob the heel grabber. That's what it means. Jacob the heel grabber. Why? Because he and Esau were twins, and he grabbed the heel of Esau. He latched on to it which gave you a clear indication, even in the womb, that he was going to be a trickster and a manipulator. So Jacob, the heel grabber, 
However, this heel-grabbing nature served him well for a moment because he held on to this man he was wrestling with all night long to receive a real blessing. Not a false blessing, not a fake blessing, not a stolen blessing, but a real blessing. One through which the promises of God will be fulfilled and one through which Jacob himself will be changed. Daybreak comes, and Jacob is no longer Jacob. He's no longer the deceiver, the supplanter. He has been renamed, and he has been reborn. His way of thinking is different. His patterns of behavior are now different. He has a new walk because he's been wounded, and he's been blessed. How do we know this? Because of my last point. He had a new life purpose, and he embraced it. A new life purpose. No longer is he standing over here in his trickster, manipulative ways, his foolishness and his failures. He's no longer in a bad condition with bad circumstances. He has now decided to pursue change. He grabbed a hold of the change maker. His name was changed. His attitude was changed, his mind was changed, his heart was changed, his way of life was changed, and now he gladly goes to meet his brother Esau. The old Jacob wouldn't do that. The old Jacob would figure out a way to get out of town. But now he's going to meet his brother, the one he knows is going to kill him, but he's okay with that because he's come to peace with God. He's come to peace with himself. He's come to peace with his new purpose in life. He would be the beneficiary now, an heir of his father, Abraham. Jacob would no longer wander in the wilderness or wander in the desert or wander from town to town trying to figure out how to get away in life, but rather he avoids his schemes and devices, and he would embrace his destiny as the seed of Abraham and the father of a nation. You see, understanding and embracing our life purpose is a life changer. See, the reason why so many people think they change, but they fall back into what they were, it's because they really never understand their life purpose. Because when you really get a hold of your life purpose, you embrace it, and when you embrace it, it becomes the motivation to keep you in that ever-changing place forward. What keeps me ever-changing? I know my purpose. My purpose is to teach the Word of God. My purpose is to love you to know Him more. It's to make God known. That's my purpose. That's what I'll do the rest of my life. I won't ever stop. I'll die maybe preaching the gospel. Wouldn't that be wonderful? I don't want it to happen today. But one day when I'm 103 and I'm leaning on the pulpit because I can't hardly stand up and I'm trying to see and all of a sudden I go quiet. And everyone thinks I'm in the spirit for a moment. But instead, I'm dead. And someone comes up and pokes me. Oh, he's not moving. Let's cart him out. You know why I'll be doing that till I'm 103? Because I know my life purpose. You know why I don't go sell cars when I get discouraged? Because I know my life purpose. You know why I don't go chop wood for the the bus? Because I know my life purpose. This is my life. I can't do anything except what I do. I mean, I could. I, I, I could figure things out. But this is the passion of my life, is to preach the Word of God. What is your passion? What is your purpose? What is your life focus? That, when you embrace it, will keep you ever-changing forward. You can't go backwards because you can't do anything except what your purpose to do. The reason people go backwards is they don't know. They don't know. So I promise I'm closing. Change is not intended to be temporary, especially when we are talking spiritual change. As we move into the new year, it is not about a new leaf but a new life. It is about being aware of your need to change. Are you aware that you need to change? If you don't think you need to change and you are deceived and living dangerously, everyone needs to change because we are none where we need to be, none of us. We are to always be progressing and growing toward the design of God, conforming to the image of Christ. 
We must be determined to pursue this change. How committed are you to the design of God in your life? Not your design, not what you want your life to be, not the plans you have made for yourself, but what has God planned for you? He wants us to live with great determination in pursuit of His will for our individual lives and destinies. And then we must be committed to remain ever-changing. It is for us to take responsibility. 2018 can be the year for you to rise up to new levels of life and blessing. The first step is to surrender to Christ. Not a portion of your life, but your whole life is to be surrendered to Christ. Amen? Amen. Well, I'm done. But we are not. We are not done. 